to talk about our lab strategies to um, think about how we might drug targets um, from a therapeutic standpoint uh, that we consider un to be undruggable. Um, and before I get started, because I don't, I don't want to run out of time, I wanted to thank the Dishbande Center leadership um, for having this opportunity. And I know I speak on behalf of Eric Stefan and Francisco Caballero in this room that we really want to make a shout out to our catalyst, Jason Sager, who's also in the room, <laughs> because uh, many of, much of what you'll see at the end of this talk, um, he's had, had great input on. Um, so, you know, in general, our lab is interested in innovating in the earliest stage of dis drug discovery in two ways. One, we'd like to expedite the process by which we validate potential targets for therapy. I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. And two, we'd like to exp expand the repertoire of potential targets uh, for which we might try and drug at some point. So it's really cool to be in Boston for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons why it's cool to be in Boston is that we're around all of these powerhouses, both in industry and academia, who are thinking about how do we convert information emerging from human genomics into therapies. And uh, we're right across the street from an institute, the Broad Institute, that played a key role in developing um, you know, the human genome. And we went from human genome sequencing more than a decade ago to now sequencing genomes. And as a community, we're trying to look at these lists. We see tons and tons of lists of different genes. And um, we want to understand the exact roles that these genes play in disease, and can we capitalize on this information to make drugs? Um, as I think you can appreciate, uh, correlations are not enough for a pharmaceutical company to really invest a lot of money in a, a proper drug discovery campaign. And uh, we need to have more information to convince ourselves that some of these genes are actually suitable targets. So in our lab, we're trying to think about different ways, to different chemical tools and approaches to try and validate, clarify the relevance of some of the proteins encoded by these genes um, as, as potential therapeutic targets. Once we build these chemical tools and probes, we'd like to uh, test the impact of modulating these, these potential disease proteins in a physiologically relevant setting. Unfortunately, these lists are not always made up of the usual suspects that we're used to from a drug development perspective. So sometimes these, these genes are uh, encode proteins where we know nothing about structure or function. and um, or they fall into this class that we call undruggable. So I put three examples of undruggable here. Um, undruggable means different things to different people, to me, to some of my colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry. When we say undruggable, we don't necessarily mean that that protein is an, is an inappropriate target for um, pharmacologic modulation. Um, usually what we mean is that no one's had success in finding a small drug-like pinch of magic dust that physically binds to that protein. Um, so three bad actors or three different classes of bad actors are shown here. One, membrane proteins. Sometimes it's very difficult to pluck a protein away from a membrane and have it retain function. In the center, you'll see that many proteins actually function primarily through interactions with other proteins or other biomolecules in the cell. And as chemists, we have not yet developed general and systematic rules for designing compounds that will disrupt these types of interactions. And then in my lab, we spend a lot of time thinking about this last bucket, conformationally dynamic proteins. These are proteins that really don't have an established state, a structural state. And uh, again, as a chemist, it's very difficult for me to think about how do you design a drug to a protein that doesn't have an established structure. So we kind of give up. And what our lab has been doing, as opposed to thinking about pure design, we actually run high throughput screens. So we take these little 384 well plates of different drugs in, in different wells, and we robotically array them onto a series of chemically derivatized glass microscope slides. In this way, we deposit picoliter volumes of different drug-like molecules onto the surface. We have some special surface chemistry I won't bore you with. Um, and we can print 10 to 20,000 different molecules at a time on a single glass slide. And then we incubate these slides with our favorite proteins um, and use different types of readouts to find these special pinches of magic dust. Um, and the reason why we like this technology is it enables us to think about a different type of screen. So traditionally what we do is we take these proteins, we purify them away from a cell, and then we find small molecules that may bind to them. 
But using this format, we're able to also screen proteins in a more native environment. We can literally take a cancer cell, crack it open, and take what we call a lysate from that cell and wash it over the slide. And that protein is now sitting next to protein partners that may help it retain its normal shape. Uh, we think this bottom scheme of screening in a more native setting enables us to also cast a wider net to not just find compounds that bind to our favorite target, but also to nearest neighbors. And while I you know, care about mechanism of action, I can tell you that when a patient gets a drug, they really don't care about mechanism of action. They don't care which one of those proteins we're targeting so long as that drug is efficacious. So when you build a technology, you want to see that it's general. We've used this technology now against many, many different, different targets, and it's all published. The other thing that you want to do when you develop a new technology is show that it can really make an impact on one of the most difficult problems in your field. And for us, we've been trying to go after what we call the classic undruggable protein, CMYK. Um, this is undruggable for the reasons that I've already told you. It engages, this purple bubble it engages many different other proteins in the cell. And it's not clear to us which of these different interactions is the best interaction to modulate from a, from a drug discovery process. Um, and on top of that, this is a very distorted protein. It's like a piece of spaghetti when it's isolated and it rolls up into a piece of rotini when it's next to these other protein partners. 20 years of effort and there's no therapeutic against this target. We ran our screen. We screened only 45,000 compounds. We got 313 initial hits. We punched those compounds into a long series of downstream functional cellular assays that I don't have time to tell you about and prioritized a small set of compounds to look at in in vivo studies. That's the starting point for our Deshbande Center uh, project. And uh, I can't tell you again all of the details, but we've now found what we would consider a lead compound. It's a very structurally novel compound that is d demonstrating tumor deceleration in one of the most aggressive models of TL TALL in our collaborators lab at the Stanford School of Medicine. And this is a completely unoptimized compound at this stage. So we didn't know what to expect, but to see this kind of effect, um, it gives us hope that we should now continue to work on these types of compounds and to continue to use this type of methodology. So where are we now? We're trying to advance this compound in a variety of ways. I just told you it was unoptimized. We need to now do proper medicinal chemistry with guidance from people from the pharmaceutical industry who've seen a lot of war stories. We need to improve potency, efficacy, and we really need to become serious about preclinical studies. And then we're also interested in understanding more about the mechanism of action for this specific compound. And um, to sort of end where we are now is that we're starting to have conversations with a, a number of venture capital groups and a number of pharmaceutical companies that are also interested in this classic undruggable target. So I'd like to, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to run this project with the Dishbande Center. <laughs>